It even makes sense. Yeah. Well, and they believe that the you know Genesis one, the council of the gods, that's let us. It's the council of yeah. of gods. Um, but I was just gonna say quick. I know you mentioned this earlier, but what what if you're listening to this? What we're evidencing here, what you're seeing is they are very very good at just throwing out claims left and right with you know nothing nothing to back it up certainly no, no scriptural support no scripture not even any not even any historical evidence for a lot of these claims so yeah, yeah i'm bummed that you guys never got to psalm 82 oh, the council no. of the gods because yes. if you have god who is the creator of all things himself saying is there a god besides me yea i know not one i that pretty much puts to bed the idea of a council of deities or gods if god has no knowledge of any other gods at all right so exactly and uh psalm 82 we might as well go ahead and do it now yeah he, for sure. he brought it up and i said let's do that we never actually got to unpack it uh this is quoted by jesus when he in john chapter 10 is surrounded by unjust judges <laughs> and that alone should give you the answer as to meaning the meaning of the passage oh absolutely absolutely in, in john chapter 10 jesus quotes from psalm 82 when jesus is surrounded by unjust judges who are judging unjustly the lord of glory himself jesus quotes from psalm 82 here's the psalm psalm 82 it says god has taken his place in the divine council in the midst of the gods he holds judgment how long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked give justice to the weak and the fatherless maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute rescue the weak and the needy deliver them from the hand of the wicked um so here's what's important is when we see the word gods there the divine council we need to understand that in God's old covenant, God actually decreed that the judges of Israel would rise up and take his place as godly divine judges over the people of Israel. And He's so the God, king of kings. Yeah, God appoints <laughs> them as divine judges to, to judge justly using God's law. This psalm, let me just say this, it's so, so important. If you're quoting Psalm 82 in a positive way, in terms of, I want me in that passage. <laughs> I want me there. I want that to represent me and my future, a divine counsel and God's. Let me just say to you right now, it is so important that you remove yourself from this passage because God in this passage isn't speaking well of these unjust judges. He actually says here in the same text, they have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said you are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations. This is an, and I love how even Walter Martin addressed this issue in his debate with Van Hale. This is an irony reference where God himself is condemning and mocking the unjust judges of Israel. And from what I understand, and I, I, I just don't have the reference myself, but I, I have looked it up in the past, I believe Talmadge gave commentary on this subject, and he says that this is God mocking the the unjust judges of Israel, not saying that you can become God. Oh, we got to find that. Or, yeah. not, or saying that God himself has a surrounding of divine counsel of other legitimate gods. This is God mocking the unjust judges of Israel who were supposed to, listen, represent God mm -hmm. as a judge so on the earth. By the new, where Torah law referred more broadly just to the Bible, okay, the, the sacred scriptures. Uh, we know, again, where the, the quotation comes from. It, it's, it's word for word. Again, using the Septuagint right out of Psalm 82. So that's not going to be a, an issue. The issue is, again, what, what is a phrase like to whom the word of God came mean? Uh, because, you know, if, if you're thinking the, the gods here are people, then, you know, the phrases that sort of surround it are going to become important for asking, asking and answering the question, well, which people are we talking about? So, again, there were two versions of this mortal view. The first one I said was Jewish elders. And the, the, here's the way this is articulated. When Jesus says, is it not written in your law, I said you are gods? And this is going to sound absurd, but this is the way it's argued. People will say, scholars will say, okay, we know that Jesus is quoting Psalm 82, verse 6. And that technically isn't in the law of Moses. It's not in the Torah, the Pentateuch. So when, G when, when Jesus says, is it not written in your law, even though he's quoting Psalm 82, verse 6, Jesus is probably connecting that thought with something in the Torah. And then they say that something in the Torah is Exodus 18. Now, if you know what Exodus 18 is, you know right away where this is going to go. Exodus 18 is the chapter where Moses, this is after the passing through of the sea, the Red Sea, the, the Sea of Reeds there in, in the Exodus event. And they get on the other side, and Moses meets up with Jethro, okay, his father-in-law. And this is the chapter where that meeting is, is you know, described, and Jethro says, hey, you know, we've heard about all these amazing things. 
that, you know, the God of the mountain, you know, God is doing for you and has done for his people. And Jethro then observes sort of the life of the camp, you know, during his visit with Moses. And he sees, you know, Moses basically spending his whole day sitting there answering people's questions about the law. You know, the law had just been given, you know, from Sinai. And Jethro says, what are you doing? And then Moses explains, well, this is, you know, I got to do this. People have questions, they've got debates, they've got, you know, problems, whatever. And so I, I answer their questions. And Jethro says, you know, this is not a good idea. What you need to do is you need to appoint people to help you. And so Exodus 18 is the chapter in which Moses appoints people who will become later sort of identified as the Jewish elders, the people who help him advise the people and interpret the law and make decisions okay about the law now you say well what how does this ha- what does this have to do with psalm 82 well it's a good question because psalm 82 of course never references anything in exodus 18 but if you read exodus 18 you will find again that there are a number of passages a number of places in exodus 18 where the word elohim occurs for instance the first verse Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God, Elohim, had done for Moses and for his people Israel, so on and so forth. Verse 5, they're encamped at the mountain of God, mountain of Elohim. Okay, so Elohim shows up a number of times in the passage. And so here's how the argument goes. Well, if you go to verse 15, Exodus 18, it says, Moses said to his father-in-law, well, the people, I do this because the people come to inquire of God inquire of Elohim. When they have a dispute, they come to me and I decide between one person and another. And I make them know the statutes of God, of Elohim and his laws. And then Jethro says, this is not a good idea. Okay. And in verse 19, he says, now obey my voice. I will give you advice and God be with you. You shall represent the people before God, Elohim, and bring their cases to God, Elohim. You shall warn them about the statutes and the law. Verse 21, Look for able men from all the people, men who fear God, fear Elohim, who are trustworthy. Verse 22, and let them judge the people at all times. So the logic here is that, well, when when Moses said earlier in the chapter that, hey, people come to ask questions of God, and they're really asking me, and then I give them answers, the logic is, well, when Moses appoints these people, these elders to judge you know, the people, then that basically means that when they come to those judges, they're coming to Elohim as well. And so the judges are sort of viewed as Elohim. And then we take that back to Psalm 82 and we say, well, the Elohim here in Psalm 82, those are just people. They're the Israelite judges way, you know, from way back in Exodus 18. Now, if you're thinking, what a convoluted, strange hermeneutic. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. Because again, if you if you just think about what you know about Psalm 82, God stands in the divine council. In the midst of the Elohim, he passes judgment. And the Elohim are getting judged again for corrupt administration, for not being ethical, for being oppressive and abusive, blah, 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 blah. And then they're called in verse 6, sons of the Most High. This is the, the, the verse Jesus quotes, I said, all of you are gods, but you're going to die like men. I mean, you look at that and say, well, it's obvious that they aren't men. I mean, they're going to die like men. God is meeting them in a, in, a, in a council. And if you go to Psalm 89, the very same language, sons of God, Elohim, council, assembly, Psalm 89 has it in the clouds, in the skies. This is, this is in the spiritual realm. Well, the, the people who make this argument from Exodus 18, they'll never show you Psalm 89. They'll never consider it. They immediately just go back to Exodus 18 because, look, their, their job, what, what they want to do, and I know this is going to sound harsh, but it's true. I haven't spent 15 years in this material and not discovered this. The task of many interpreters is to avoid divine plurality in the Bible. That it, it's just that simple. They think it, 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 it you know, affects monotheism. They think you know, it, it creates polytheism in, in Israelite thinking, even the biblical writers. They just don't want to go there. And so this is an escape valve. This is a convenient way to dismiss the question. It doesn't matter that it doesn't make any sense. And again, I address this at length in Unseen Realm, why this is incoherent. 
again, for, for those who are, are new to my content, just go to thedivinecouncil.com and, and you'll get the education that, that you need to, to know what's going on with Psalm 82 and why the consensus view is just frankly absurd. Uh, no Israelite would have been thinking this, you know, the, the, the consensus view that these are just people. And it doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't mean polytheism, okay? It doesn't harm Israelite monotheism. I mean, I, I've, I've put out dozens and dozens of things and probably at this point, maybe a hundred hours of content going over this material. So listeners, again, should be well familiar with it. If you're new to the podcast, then you need to get caught up. Uh, we have videos on the website, again, for the Israelite supernatural worldview. You can get caught up. But this is how the thinking goes. So when Jesus, again, quotes this passage, doesn't it say in your law, and of course he quotes Psalm 82, 6, but he references, he uses the word law. So Jesus wants us to think of, of the Torah proper, and he wants us to think of Exodus 18. He wants us to think of the appointment of judges. And so, so that the gods in Psalm 82 that he's actually quoting are just human judges. They're, they're the elders of Israel. Well, again, if, if, if that's the same, or if, if, if that's the case, you got a number of problems. First, and they start in Exodus 18, every occurrence of Elohim in that chapter can be translated capital G-O-D talking about God, talking to God, okay, you know, fearing God, being blessed by God, God be with you. You don't, there, there isn't a single occurrence of Elohim, okay, in Exodus 18 that needs to be plural except for one reference to foreign pagan gods. And obviously those aren't the Israelite elders or the God of Israel. My point is that uh, translations like ESV do a good job here. You don't need to have plurality here. In fact, Translating Elohim as plural in any other instance just doesn't make any sense. It's just talking about God. The human judges, the appointees in Exodus 18, are never actually called Elohim in Exodus 18. It never happens. Okay, it, it, you know, it doesn't happen elsewhere either, you know, where you have human judges referred to as, as Elohim. So from the get-go, even the the, the, so the presumed Old Testament basis of this is flawed. The, the thinking about Psalm 82 is deeply flawed. But this is something you're going to read in standard commentaries. It's one of the mortal, it, it's option one of the mortal view, which is the consensus view. Well, I get to call myself the Son of God and the Sons of God in Psalm 82, 6 or Elohim, just like you guys do. We're all just one big happy family. You know, break out the Barney song, okay? It just, it doesn't make any sense to have Jesus saying, cool off, boys. The language I'm using about myself, you could use about yourself, too. It just doesn't make sense. Now, the second option for the mortal view is Israelites in general. You know, a lot of commentators prefer the first one because Jesus is speaking to ostensibly, you know, Jewish elders. And so they, they're thinking, well, that, that's the connection here. But there's another alternative here, Israelites in general. Let's go back to John 10, 34 and 35, and I'll read it again, and, and you'll see where this view comes from. So Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law, I said, you are gods? If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, ah, Ah, oh, the commentators will say, aha, to whom the word of God came. That's, quote unquote, obviously a reference to the giving of the law to, it, to the Israelites at Sinai. Therefore, the gods are the Israelites. Ta-da. Okay. Again, this is how the logic goes. Now, an obvious question should be raised here. Is Psalm 82, which is the source of the quotation, describing events at Sinai? Is there anything in the psalm that points to the gathering at Sinai? And the answer is no. Again, this is just an invented, imported context, an imposed context on Psalm 82 to humanize the Elohim. That's all it is. So mortal view number one, Jewish elders, mortal view number two, all the Israelites, again, because to whom the word of God came, oh, that must refer to Sinai. No, think about Psalm 82. Ask yourself the question, okay, well, let's go to Psalm 82. One. God has taken his place in the divine council. 
in the midst of the gods, in the midst of the Elohim, he holds judgment. So he's having a meeting with other Elohim. And then in verses 2 to 5, he just starts railing on them, just railing on them. And then in verse 6, you know, we get to our quotation verse. I said, you are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you're going to die and fall like any prince. So here's the question. To whom does the word of God come in Psalm 82? It comes to the gods. It doesn't come to Israelites at Sinai. In other words, just read the passage for what it says. The gods are being addressed in the divine council. Psalm 82 verse 1 gives you the setting. It doesn't say that the setting is Sinai. Okay? Psalm 82 1 gives you the setting. It's the divine council. And of course, we go to Psalm 89 and lots of other passages. The divine council refers to, you know, God's headquarters, God's meeting place in the spiritual world. It has nothing to do with giving two tablets to the to Moses or to the Israelites at Sinai. It's very clear to whom the word of God came in Psalm 82. The answer is the gods, it's not the Israelites. So I'm hoping you see again what I've just given you might sound kind of dumb. But it is the consensus view. One of those two options is, is going to represent the consensus view. Somehow, people want to argue that the gods of Psalm 82 are just human, and they do it to escape divine plurality in the Hebrew Bible. That's just point blank what's going on here. And then they import that to Psalm 82. So what if we look at Psalm 82 the way we should look at it. We take the divine view. Again, that the, the Elohim of Psalm 82 that, that are getting railed against are gods. They're spiritual beings. Again, Elohim has nothing to do with a specific set of unique attributes. We do not have polytheism here. Again, I'm sorry if the divine counsel content is new to you, but I can't keep rehearsing divine counsel stuff in every episode of the podcast. Go to thedivinecouncil.com. Watch some of the introductory videos on my homepage, and you'll get up to speed. Uh, but we're going to assume the divine view, again, that we're talking about divine plurality here. Yahweh is an Elohim, but no other Elohim or Yahweh. There's lots of Elohim. Some of them are loyal. Some of them are disloyal. We're talking in Psalm 82 about some disloyal ones. We have a divine council meeting to excoriate them and pronounce an eschatological punishment on them that is connected elsewhere to the day of the Lord. 